ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of the chapter and the whole cathedral community, a very warm welcome to Durham Cathedral for this evening's lecture presented by Durham Cathedral Institute, bringing the public square into the sacred space of Durham Cathedral, which is safe space, a place of sanctuary undergirded by faith and the legacy of hundreds of years of prayer and inquiry. We are very grateful to the Durham branch of Stowe Family Law, which is kindly sponsoring the event. And thank you too to staff and volunteers of the cathedral whose hard work and enthusiasm have brought us to this evening. We have some very special guests amongst us this evening, and they are sixth form students from various schools in the region, and I'm going to tell you who they are. We have our own Durham Cathedral Schools Foundation present this evening, and also St Cuthbert's Catholic High School from Newcastle, Sacred Heart School from Newcastle, St Leonard's School here in Durham, and St Mary's Catholic School, again from Newcastle, Cardinal Hume in Gateshead, St Bede's School here in Durham, and the Ian Ramsey Church of England Academy at Stockton-on-Tees. You are amongst our VIPs this evening, and we are very glad that you're here. But thank you to all of you for being present. Please engage in all that happens here, and know that you are always welcome. The next Institute debate is already scheduled, so keep an eye on our website and come back then and as often as you wish. Simon Oliver, who leads the Institute, is our chair this evening, and I hand over now to him to introduce our speakers. very much. My name is Simon Oliver. I'm Professor of Theology at Durham University and one of the uh, residentary canons here at the Cathedral and uh, a director of the Durham Cathedral Institute. We're delighted to welcome you here this evening. One or two practical matters. Uh, we are very high tech here in Durham Cathedral, so when it comes to the Q&A, after our speakers have uh, addressed us, you can scan this code with, with a phone and it will take you directly to an app called Slido. There's nothing to download. And on that app, as if by magic, you can type in any question you would like to ask. It will magically appear on an iPad here at the front that I will have. You can ask your questions whenever you want, uh, from now uh, until we finish this evening at 9 o'clock. Many of those questions will be made public, so you'll be able to see them. You can vote up the questions you like, and they will be given priority. It's a bit like Strictly Come Dancing. So, so uh, please do ask your questions. Uh, they will come to me at the front, and then I will put them to our speakers, to John and Fiona, uh, in our Q&A discussion. Uh, if you would rather write a question using the analog version, just turn the paper over and write it, hold it up, and one of the stewards will come and get it for you. And they'll bring it to the table here, okay? So that's a slip of paper here, scan the QR code, and you'll get to Slido, and you can type in your question, whatever you would like to ask, and the comments that you would like to make. This evening we've gathered together to learn about and discuss what's become known as levelling up social mobility, and opportunity. At the 29 elect, 20, 2019 election, levelling up was the flagship policy of the Conservative Party. It aims to address regional inequalities uh, in prosperity, health, education and opportunities. Many of those inequalities uh, have been evident, deeply embedded for generations. The levelling up white paper was published in February this year and Liz Trust, the new Prime Minister, has declared a continued commitment to the programme. But it has been a slow start. A report by the Newcastle Business School, based at Northumbria University, has uh, been published this week. And it claims that of the 12 missions of levelling up between now and 2030, only one of those 12 
is demonstrably on track. So there's much work to be done. It's early days, but we know that increasing opportunities, addressing inequalities, uh, addressing prosperity and well-being, identifying, celebrating and realising the extraordinary talents and history and culture of regions such as the North East is so much more than government policy and statistics. Government policies come and go. The culture of this region extends back at least 1,300 years to the two saints between whom we sit this evening. St. Bede behind you in the West End, St. Cuthbert behind me in the East End. And we are greatly privileged this evening to welcome two Northeasterners to address these issues of levelling up and social opportunity. Dr. Fiona Hill, whom I'll introduce to you in a moment, and Professor John Tomine. John Tomine is uh, originally from County Durham. He's currently Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at University College in London. Prior to his appointment at UCL, John was Professor of Regional Development and Director of the Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies at Newcastle University. John's research concerns development of cities and regions as socio-economic and political and cultural phenomena and the role of public policy in their management. He focuses particularly on governance of local and regional economies. John's published over 100 books and articles on these questions of local and regional development. He's one of the country's leading experts on this area, and we're delighted and honoured to welcome him to speak to us this evening. Would you welcome John Tomney? Simon for that uh, very warm welcome and thank you to Durham Cathedral Institute for the invitation to uh, come here this evening. It's a, a very great indeed exceptional honour to be asked to speak in this magnificent cathedral, a, a building I have known since I was a child. Indeed I, I went to school at St Leonard's and I'm delighted that there are pupils here from St Leonard's this evening which is just up the road from here. So I can say, I think with some justification, that this building loomed over my childhood. Uh, and when I travel back by train from London, of course, I always look out of the window to take in a spectacular view from the viaduct. And at that point, of course, I know that I'm home. Uh, although I was born a Catholic, I've been many times to this cathedral to pay homage to the great Northumbrian saints Oswald being in Cuthbert, who Simon says, are, whose remains are around us. And I'm very aware that this building has lain at the heart of the region's spiritual life for a millennium. But the cathedral has also been a site of political dramas. Half Church of God, half Castle against the Scot uh, is how Sir Walter Scott, the great poet and novelist, described the cathedral in his poem Marmion. And these are words etched onto Preben's bridge, and I'm sure many of you will know them. But it signals this political character that's attached to this place as well. And in 1569, Catholic mass was said here as the signal for the rising of the North, the last great rebellion against the Tudor state in defence of the region's traditional rights, privileges and autonomies. Elizabeth I crushed the rebellion with exceptional brutality and the executed rebels had their heads placed on spikes across the region as a warning to others. Writing in 1905 about the rebellion, the historian Rachel Reed lamented its defeat and she called the North in a phrase which echoes down time, the land of lost causes. So the cathedral, I believe, is a good place to debate the future of our region. 
It's also a very great pleasure to be here with uh, Dr. Fiona Hill. Uh, Fiona's book, There Is Nothing For You Here, is about many things. It's a very rich and rewarding read. But contained within it is one of the best accounts you will read of the modern history of County Durham. It charts the decline of the coal industry, which employed generations of Fiona's family and mine. But what's significant about the book, I think, is that it also examines the social consequences of this economic change and the impacts this had on communities. If you haven't already done so, I urge you to read it, the book. Fiona sets out much of the context for the debate about left behind places and levelling up, which is the uh, question we've been asked to address tonight. And I'd like to do that by unpicking or unpacking these contentious terms, left behind uh, and levelling up. First, left behind. What does this mean? What do we mean when we refer to the left behind or left behind places? Typically, this refers to places which have been bypassed by the economic growth which is concentrated in the big cities and where wealth has accumulated in recent decades. It's a term that has become widely used by politicians and in the media, especially since 2016, and especially in the UK and the US. In the UK, it's been used to explain the political geography of Brexit and the 2019 general election. And here, of course, in this country, it's often linked with the term Red War, which is used to refer to those traditional Labour Labour voting parliamentary seats that switched to the Conservatives in large numbers in 2019. Some political scientists suggested this signalled a great realignment of British politics and the emergence of a new political coalition. And not so very long ago, this coalition, we were being confidently told by the commentators in London, would keep Boris Johnson in 10 Downing Street for 10 years. Left behind places are usually defined in relation to social and economic indicators. That is, for instance, low levels of economic growth and productivity, low levels of household wealth, house prices, educational attainment, and on the other hand, high levels of unemployment and ill health. And it's a fact that County Durham scores poorly on most of these measures. But left behind places are not simply aggregations of statistics, they are also communities. Think about the many former mining villages of County Durham. These are places with strong historical identities. These identities, for instance, are proudly paraded each July at the Durham Miners Gala. Once a dreamt demonstration mainly of trade union power, it's now very much, in my view, a festival of the villages of Durham. The banners that are paraded are symbols of village identity. They present an iconography of County Durham. The blessing of the banners here in the cathedral is always a most moving occasion and as a spectacle, as, an, as, an, as a free concert on an epic scale, the Durham Miners Gala is very, very difficult to beat. The closure of the coal mines, therefore, was not just reflected in deteriorating economic statistics, but also in feelings of loss. Loss for a way of life based on community. This is something Fiona describes with great poignancy in her book. These communities were not perfect, as I think both Fiona and I can attest very well. But they, were, they, but they embodied great social achievements. The Methodist chapels, the Miners Institutes, 
the Catholic churches, the co-ops, the libraries and debating halls. These were all built by the people of the villages from their own resources and gave village life a vibrant culture and a deep sense of community. And this is what people feel has been lost. Among other things, community action provided what Fiona in her book calls infrastructures of opportunity. These were the means by which to organize and advance the interests of the people of the county and improve the conditions of life and provide routes for those who wanted to leave to move out. But statistics do also matter and there have been some shocking ones to consider recently. A study just published in the British Medical Journal has estimated that 330,000 deaths in the UK since 2010 can be attributed to the effects of austerity, that is, cuts in public services. The deaths are concentrated in the poorest areas, and this means that there are parts of the North East where average life expectancy is falling for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. A most appalling statistic concerns suicides. Recent data from the Office for, the National, for, the Office for National Statistics shows the suicide rate in the North East is the highest in England, twice the rate of London. Within the region, men in their 50s are the most prone to suicide. This is a barely discussed public health crisis. How do we explain it? The best explanation I have come across is from the US, where similar trends are visible in left behind places there. There, Anne Case and Angus Deaton of Princeton University have said that such men are susceptible to what they call diseases of despair. Because, and I quote, they have lost the narratives of their lives. Now, levelling up. This purports to be an agenda that addresses the conditions I have just described. But to call it an agenda is a misnomer. It is a largely empty political slogan. Indeed, it may be time, I think, to write the obituary of levelling up. It's over before it began. Since 2019, the problems that Boris Johnson pledged to address, the problems of the left behind as he described them shortly after being elected, have, by every available measure, worsened. Coming here this evening, I had a long chat with a taxi driver, Tony from Gateshead, um, who referred to so-called levelling up. And when taxi drivers from Gateshead have decided that it's so-called levelling up, I think the game is over. Primarily, levelling up was Boris Johnson's attempt to consolidate the great alignment that I mentioned earlier. But as Andy Pike of Newcastle University and I pointed out in an article uh, in the Political Quarterly in 2020, his strategy rested on a fundamental flaw. That was, many members of his own party did not believe in it. The ones who were most sceptical about it, the Britannia Unchained mob, are now in charge of the government, if that's the right term. <laughs> you laugh, but it's not funny. So, some aspects of the white paper. Uh, sorry, uh, earlier in the year, then, um, the government did produce a levelling up white paper. Its authors, though, have since been expelled from the government, and I would suggest its provisions have been implicitly disavowed. Some aspects of the white paper are welcome, and I could discuss what I see as being, as being of value in it. But I think it is weakest when it addresses the issues about community that I raised earlier, 
and which must lie at the heart of any new approach to tackling the problems of left behind places. The white paper reduces questions of community to blandishments about pride in place. But we need more than a few hanging baskets to improve the lives of the people Boris Johnson promised to help. Where might we look for these alternatives? I want to suggest we do not need to look far for, for inspiring examples, and I will offer two. First, come with me to Sacristan, short distance from here, and to the old co-op building on Plawsworth Road. The building was opened by the Anfield Plain Industrial and Cooperative Society in 1897, itself an epic effort in self-help. But by the end of the 1960s, the co-op had closed and more recently it stood empty and decayed. But in, the, in 2019, a group of local people took control of the building and have repurposed it to meet community needs. Today, it contains the Sacristan Youth Project, which provides out-of-school childcare for families that otherwise would not be able to afford it. It also contains the Sacristan Woodshed Workshop, a brilliant enterprise that teaches woodworking skills to young people struggling in the school system. These are inspiring initiatives led by great people that could be replicated in other places with the right support. Historic buildings brought back to use to meet current needs, echoing the efforts of the pioneers who built these communities in the first place. Tomorrow morning at Usher College, I'll be speaking in more detail about the history of Sacristan a fascinating place, rich in characters and dramas, and the more you delve into its history, the more fascinated you become by it. A second initiative I'd point to is the plan to refurbish and reinvent Red Hills, the Durham Miners Hall. Another magnificent building you can see from the viaduct as you arrive in Durham. It was, one of the it was once the headquarters of the mighty Durham Miners Association. Red Hills was built from the pennies and sixpences of the Durham miners. It contains the Pittman's Parliament, the imposing debating chamber where miners delegates debated the great industrial and political issues of the day, where they developed local schemes to improve the health, housing and education of the people of Durham. The current plan is to turn the building into a contemporary centre for learning, culture and heritage and to support the developments that are taking place in Sacristan and similar ones elsewhere in the county. Again, the aim is to repurpose a historical building to meet contemporary needs. The projects I've described face enormous challenges in the best of times, but we are now in, the very, in, the, in very difficult times. None of them are guaranteed success, but they demonstrate the enormous potential of communities to help themselves. Such initiatives should be at the heart of any serious effort to level up and rebuild left behind places. Indeed, stories such as the one uh, from Sacristan that I've told reveal how misapplied the term left behind is here. These are places which are seeking to rebuild, move ahead in the face of great obstacles, not so much left behind as held back. Now, a word about the role of universities in this debate, speaking as an academic and in a context of the Durham Cathedral Institute, which is supported by Durham University. In theory, universities are stocked with knowledge, expertise and resources that could be put to use in the service of left behind places. This is certainly true of my university, which is ranked among the best in the world for its research. It's been home to 29 Nobel laureates. I'm lucky to have many brilliant colleagues. But the truth is that universities have traditionally been very poor at engaging with the most disadvantaged communities. Where engagement does occur, it more often benefits the university than the community. And often the university moves on when the grant runs out. In competition with other universities for diminishing research funds, cooperation is hard to find between universities. And a much harder truth is that many universities are mechanisms not for solving the problems of the most disadvantaged, but rather for reproducing inequality and replicating elites that, we might argue, have not served our country particularly well in recent times. 
Here I am not joining the stupid recent attacks on universities by some politicians with their absurd criticisms that all we teach are Harry Potter studies and other such nonsense. Instead, I'm asking universities to take, much, to take much more seriously their obligations to the communities that have been left behind. And as, as universities have become bigger, richer and more powerful, the agenda I've set out is a challenging one for universities. It goes against the grain of the way we operate and our definitions of academic excellence. But what use is our science? What use is our science if it does not help those most in need? This is a challenging agenda. And when I'm asked how universities should tackle it, my answer is with humility. We live in exceptionally testing times both here and abroad. It could be hard to be optimistic, but we can always be hopeful. My thinking in this regard is always guided by the great Czech writer Václav Havel, who became president of his country after the fall of communism in 1989. Havel said, hope is not the same thing as optimism. It is the conviction that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. So thank you to Durham Cathedral Institute for inviting me to speak this evening. Thank you to Fiona for her brilliant book and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, John. It's my great pleasure now to introduce you to Fiona Hill. Fiona, um, as you all know, is a native of Bishop Auckland, where her father worked as a coal miner and later as a hospital porter, and her mother as a midwife. She studied at the University of St Andrews, after which she won a scholarship to Harvard, where she earned a PhD in Russian history. From 2006 to 2009, Fiona was an intelligence analyst under Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and in 2017 she was appointed by Donald Trump as Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Europe and Russia in the White House National Security Council. In 2019 she was thrown into the public spotlight when she testified at President Trump's first impeachment trial. She now works as a Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington. That's the less famous Washington on the other side of the Atlantic, of course. <laughs> Fiona is, as John mentioned, the author of the best-selling book, There Is Nothing For You Here, published last year. She's become a major public figure in the US and the UK, commenting on domestic politics and global affairs. And more recently, she's turned her attention to social mobility and community regeneration, both in the US here and in Germany. Her book is a moving and inspiring account of her journey from the coal house to the White House, as she puts it, as well as a very potent argument for increasing opportunities and prosperity in some of the poorest left behind regions of the world. Would you welcome Fiona Hill? Well, it's an absolute honour to be with everyone, and especially here in Durham Cathedral, um, which, you know, just like John, I've visited as a child so many times. It's a very familiar place to me, and I think, you know, to be honest, it's a bit overwhelming being here. Um, I mentioned to Simon uh, when I first came in, the only time I've ever spoken in Durham Cathedral was probably when I was laughing with some friends and was then told to shut up and keep my voice down. So um, it's, it's kind of quite a, a surprise to be actually asked to speak. Uh, in um, such a, a, a wonderful um, setting. And I also want to you know, thank John, obviously, for... Um, I, I didn't really expect John to frame this topic that he's such an expert in around um, the themes of the book. I want to give a little bit of an explanation as a way of leading into our discussion about why I wrote this book, um, which, you know, as an academic, 
it's not usual to tell your own story. But as a result of strange confluences of circumstances, I mean, my expertise is on Russia, um, also Ukraine, and you know, here we are in the middle of a dreadful war in, in Ukraine. I had set off to study Russia and Russian against the backdrop, and I, I can see around here that some people will remember this too, of the war scare of 1983. If we think back to the 1980s, the Soviet Union and the United States seemed poised to engage in a nuclear confrontation just like they had in the 1960s. In fact, we just had President Biden of the United States apparently talking to um, a recent gathering of the Democratic Party about nuclear Armageddon. And I can see some of the younger you know, people here from all the various schools, and it's just great to have everyone here. But you know, when I was at your age, probably as you are now, I spent a lot of time worrying about you know, the kind of prospect of nuclear annihilation. That seemed to kind of put everything I go levels and air levels in perspective. You know, what was the point if we were just going to get blown up you know, the very next day? But I was actually advised by um, a relative of mine, my uncle Charlie Crabtree, who um, came from um, Crook in County Durham, who had fought all the way through World War II and had actually been sunk on his ship and blown up to the surface and saved by depth charges that were being uh, dropped by the British Navy to take out uh, German u boats So imagine, you know, kind of thinking you're dying, go down the ship, the next thing you're blown up to the surface. Uncle Charlie, let's just say, was a pretty fierce, fearless person by this point. He said to me, well, look, instead of worrying and fretting about this, why don't you go out and try and figure out why the Russians are trying to blow us up, why the Soviets are trying to blow us up? How did we come from being wartime allies uh, to current time enemies? So I set out on what I thought was going to be a very kind of but difficult anyway journey to try to understand what was happening in much larger affairs. Fast forward through all of these various um, things that I've done uh, that uh, Simon was recounting in my resume, and I found myself in probably the strangest position that I would ever have imagined, I could never have imagined it, being asked to testify in the impeachment trial of a US president. And it was of course related to the things that I'd been working on. In fact, there's a straight line from that impeachment trial to where we are now with the war in Ukraine. Because President Trump was having a phone call with the president of uh, Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, the man we see on television every single day under siege, and extorting him and trying to force him to do something for his own personal political gain. And of course, that was quite shocking um, in any kind of context. And I was there and you know, called upon with other colleagues that many of you might have seen if you watched that, to stand up and bear witness and tell the truth. And we also got attacked on many different fronts from people, many of the supporters of President Trump, and asked, you know, who gave us the right to do all of this? We were accused of being uh, unpatriotic and a naturalized uh, US citizen, like George Washington and his family. There's the plaque to the Washington family here in Durham Cathedral, I think, on that side near one of the doors. And, you know, we were accused of being these out of touch elites who were just trying to bring down the president. And I thought, no, that. That's not the case. After seeing this, you know, tax on my colleagues, I've got to explain who I am. And for the very first time in the opening statement of that testimony, I put myself in the story, which I'd never done before. I always wanted to be the expert, the person who was trying to explain, as Uncle Charlie had asked me to explain, why the Russians wanted to blow us up, what was going on in these relationships. And suddenly I had to explain myself. And I, in the opening statement, I told my story. Not quite, you know, with all of the detail, but basically you know, I came from County Durham, the north of England, a place with these long ties to the United States and the Washington family, the place where George Washington's family uh, was originally from. Came from a long line of coal miners, you know, people who had always, you know, had these strong, affectionate ties with the United States. And, you know, I was there coming today to basically bear witness. And I also said that America had given me opportunities that I would never have had at home. And that's why I want to explain this, because it's entirely related to the agenda that John has laid out into the topic of the discussion today. And it was true that America gave me these amazing opportunities. I mean, I certainly wouldn't have been advised in the White House if I'd stayed in the United Kingdom, a bit obvious, right? But at the same time, after I'd said that, and later, when all of this was over and I was in the strange position of being recognized in the street and you know, the weird things that happened to me afterwards, I reflected on that and I thought, well, actually, the opportunity started here in County Durham. Because I was the product of funding for education by County Durham Council Open Education Authority. Because when I was at school in the 
I started obviously in the late 1960s, I was born in 1965, but in the 1970s, and also into the 1980s, when I went to University at St Andrews, everything was paid for by the local education authority. So I, I know it's a bit daunting for everyone who's at school now in sixth form thinking about going to university college. But there's a lot of onus on you to pay for yourselves. But back in that, those days, if your parents didn't have the means, and mine certainly did not, they were going to be covered by the county council. And I thought about that for a long time. And actually, that opportunity began through education. An opportunity to actually go out on that quest to figure out the, the question that my Uncle Charlie had posed and that I wanted to learn about too, to understand what was going on in the larger um, international affairs. And it was because of that hand, hand out, that leg up that, that was given to me through education. And of course, you know, the United States um, might have managed to progress in that level. But then I started to look back again at also what was happening in the larger environment around me. How would we got to this kind of position that you'd have a president of the United States trying to extort another president for his own you know, political gain? And how would everything happen in the United States? And it was really a story about the breakdown of representative democracy and about people feeling left behind in lots of other places as well. So when we look at what happened with President Trump in the United States, he was actually elected by only 70,000 votes in three counties in three states of the United States. A very divisive person, a very divisive president, and he wasn't somebody who was actually a member of the Republican Party that he'd been elected by. He was a, an, uh, an outsider who kind of jumped into, provident, uh, into prominence as a reality TV uh, personality. And the whole party system in the United States, and to some degree here in the United Kingdom, had broken down. And he short-circuited the representational aspect of it. In fact, he was promising to be the champion of people, not their representative, only the champion of people who voted for him. And this is the essence of populism in, in politics, something that we're grappling with on, on many different fronts now, in Europe as well as here in the United Kingdom. The taking away of people's voices, the playing on grievances, and dividing people into groups of us and them. And it was a very antithesis of the environment in which I'd grown up in, here in County Durham in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, even though there was so much of a decline uh, in the economy, there was still a real strong sense of community and responsibility for others, and people still felt that at that point they had something of a voice. And I started to try to think to myself how to explain what had happened in American politics to see how we'd got to this particular point. And also what had happened in the United Kingdom as well, with a similar kind of polarisation and fracturing of the political space. And people also, in the case of the Brexit debates and many other debates in the United Kingdom, feeling that they didn't really have a voice. And so the book came out of all of this. And I don't want to talk about it too long because I'd actually like us to all have our voice here and have a discussion and ask questions. But it was a way of trying to explain and understand for myself about how we'd reached a point of such fracturing. And it's all in the essence of what uh, John has described here. When people get left behind, the, the, the feelings of representation get lost, the, the sense that they don't have a voice, it's open to manipulation and exploitation. And you know, one of the things that they said in the book is that when people get left behind, it has political consequences. We've seen that here in the United Kingdom, but you saw it in spades in the United States. And the, the, those 70,000 votes for Donald Trump in those three counties and three states all came from very similar places to County Durham in the northeast of England. Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, places where everybody had been left behind as well. And there was a sort of feeling that nobody ever came. There was no levelling up agenda there or uh, no kind of discussion about how to bring those places back into politics again. So people were looking for a champion, somebody who was going to solve their problems for them, help them take back control, all of those same slogans, make America great again, make their lives great again, and turn back the clock to a different point when they felt, felt themselves to be uh, in, a, in a prominent uh, position. So it's the, it's the essence of uh, the issue here that we're grappling with is that it has political consequences. Now I want to put that in a frame of where we are right now in this war in Ukraine and Russia. Now why do I want to do that? Because this, uh, what we're seeing today, is the consequence of having a champion who has short-circuited uh, politics to the extreme. Vladimir Putin is the only person who matters in the political system in Russia. That wasn't the case back in the 1980s or the 1990s, uh, for example, or even in the early parts of the 2000s, when there was actually a more vibrant party system uh, and political debate in Russia. And Vladimir Putin shot through the party system 
Uh, basically, he's not a member of a party. He is only supported by the Russian constitution and also by the um, population, popular acclaim, the ultimate populist. And he's able, as a result of that, to take decisions that have no checks and balances against them. And I worry very much that you know we at large might head in a similar direction here by you know basically not realising that we have agency as well. I think the essence of what John said at the very end of his presentation there was that we have essence, we all have a voice, we have agency, we have an ability to do things collectively. And the reason that I um, ended up where I ended up was because of going back uh, to a, a long generation um, of people being activists. John mentioned Sacristan. Um, my grandfather was also born in Sacristan. Uh, my great-grandfather, Thompson Hill, was one of uh, the spokesmen for the Durham Miners Association. And when I set off on my journey to study Russian in 1984, I got a grant from the Durham Miners Association, actually for monies that had been raised uh, from miners' uh, unions around the world during the miners' strike. And it's, it'll be a bit of a surprise to hear that, but my money came from the miners of Donbass. So the money that I got as a small bursary to go and study Russian had been raised by the miners of Donbass. Because the miners of County Durham, the Durham Miners Association, and Red Hills and Pittman's Parliament had had exchanges with Donbass region, the mining region, going back to the 1920s. In fact, many of those exchanges were led by miners' wives. And when Red Hills opens up again, Pittman's Parliament, and it encouraged people to go and look at the archives there, of these really fascinating visits by um, miners' wives' delegations to go and see how mines were organized and family life was organized in the Donbass region. So we've got a connection here in the Northeast uh, to that region going back for more than 100 years. And what was the important point of the Durham Miners Association uh, was that they banded together in the toughest times to pool their resources, as John pointed out, to make things happen for education, to make things happen uh, in, in their own societies and their own communities, uh, to try to change things. And I benefited from that education right in the, in the larger context. And I just want to conclude here because the problem that we're going to be facing as we look forward <laughs> is that we're now in a wartime scenario. We have problems in the crises at home that have been uh, very ably uh, described here by John and that we're all very well aware of. But as this war goes on in, uh, in Ukraine, which I'm afraid that it will, there's going to be more and more knock-on effects. It's, it's basically the third great power conflict in Europe in more than 100 years. It's very similar to what happened in World War I and World War II, uh, of, of, of basically that kind of global changing event through war, through hot war, uh, not just cold war, uh, on the ground in Ukraine. We're seeing the knock-on effects on energy. We're all going to be facing um, increased energy prices. We're going to be seeing the consequences in our supermarkets uh, from food insecurity uh, brought on by the blockade of the Black Sea by, uh, by the Russians, by the Kremlin. And we're also going to see a kind of a huge just changing in, in, in the global order, the end of an order that's brought stability for us since uh, World War to and since the end of the Cold War. We've already seen this with, I'm sure people have been reading today about the OPEC decision to cut back on energy, for example, which seems to put the Saudis in you know, a different camp from the United States and the UK, for example. So all these things are happening. The kinds of things that people, you know, for the best part of a century coming in here into Durham Cathedral would have been aware of. And in a wartime scenario, it becomes incumbent upon us to, on the home front, to, uh, to figure out how we're going to deal with us. That's something that all of our communities have been aware of. And in, and in many respects, in, in the absence of the funding that comes with that agenda of levelling up, it's going to be incumbent on all of us here to figure out what are we going to do uh, to really change the circumstances. And again, my own experience and everything um, that has been made possible for me has been by people banding together, working together, realising that they have their own agency through education uh, and through uh, collective action. Now, I think that I mean, we've got a lot of questions coming in right now, Simon, haven't we? And I just wanted to say just a little bit more, more personal uh, slant to all of this, but John laid out, I think, the, the subject of tonight's uh, debate brilliantly, so there wasn't much more to add to that. I was crossing out my own notes as I was going along with the things that I was going to say. <laughs> so I thought I'd take a, a slightly different tack. So thank you um, very much for everyone being here. And again, it's all of our ideas and uh, all of our thoughts are really going to propel things forward.
check this. Okay, good. The microphone works. You can hear me okay. Excellent. So we have a good number of questions coming in. Please do, um, if you've got a phone with you, have a look at the questions that are being asked and do let me know which ones you think are particularly important and interesting. And then please add your own, either anonymously um, or do tell us uh, who you are and where you're from. So, um, John and Fiona, I'm going to begin by asking um, a question from Alex, who's from Durham Cathedral Schools Foundation. Are trickle-down tactics, policies effective? If not, why not? Is the current government implementing these ineffectively? Are these policies fundamentally flawed? Trickle-down. John. Uh, trickle-down policies are proven to be ineffective. We have mountains of evidence to this effect. And so the suggestion that, of the trust government that what they want to do is deregulate the economy to release the forces that will produce growth will not solve the problems that I outlined earlier. Growth is very likely to concentrate in places which are already rich. That's how the process works. Wealth accumulates in certain places. The principal proposal that the Trust Government has brought forward is for investment zones. And these are really a reworking of a very old Thatcherite idea of the enterprise zone, which under Johnson was uh, reinvented again as free ports and is now being invented as, uh, reinvented yet again as investment zones. And there's no real evidence that enterprise zones made any real difference to economic development in the places that we would call the left behind places. The only place that enterprise zones could be said to have possibly worked, but it's not clear that they were the key factor at work, was in the London Docklands, uh, which is now the site of the Canary Wharf development. But if you look at the um, uh, operation of enterprise zones elsewhere in the country, particularly up here in the Northeast, there's very little evidence that they added additional economic growth and certainly very little evidence that they added jobs to the local economy. What they did was provide incentives for firms to make very short distance moves out from outside in, uh, enterprise zones to inside enterprise zones to gain advantages in terms of tax treatment, uh, planning uh, obligations and so on. So the idea that um, by deregulating and, and, and releasing the power of the market this will generate growth and will benefit the places which have so far been excluded from it, I think rests on the flimsiest of possible foundations. I think uh, President Biden said something to this effect the other day, that tri we, the, the one thing we know about trickle-down economics is that it doesn't work. Yeah, I know. Uh, make a couple of comments on that with the, um, John's giving you the segue there of, uh, with the US, um, where we've got actually uh, several examples of trying trickle down recently versus actually targeted um, interventions. So under the um, Trump administration, um, as most of you are very well aware, President Trump did a lot of deregulation. Uh, there was all kinds of environmental deregulation, for example, pulling out of the Paris uh, Treaty, uh, climate treaty, uh, pulling back from um, all other, uh, lots of other, you know, restrictions on um, uh, various uh, industrial and uh, commercial uh, development. And it actually was the case, um, initially, before COVID, that um, uh, in many respects um, unemployment went down and there was a lot more economic activity. You had a lot of people um, doing multiple jobs. Um, often it was, you know, something like a rideshare, Lyft or Uber, in addition to working in restaurants. And it was actually possible for people to kind of get ahead uh, by having a cluster of, um, of jobs in a more deregulated environment and, you know, companies hiring on a larger scale. But the problem came when COVID came along. Because what you saw is, in the United States, of course, is the vagaries of not having a national health system, but the single payer system and also the benefits coming through private um, employees. What uh, uh, the Trump administration created is a lot of people who were essentially self-employed. And as soon as COVID came, they didn't have any benefits. They didn't have health benefits, they didn't have uh, employment insurance, and unemployment rates went right up again. There is actually 
however, another story in the United States over a long period of time where a kind of a mixture um, of uh, these policies actually has had a long-term effect on the reduction of poverty. Poverty in the United States has gone down consistently over the last several decades, where here in the United States it's gone up uh, because of um, austerity measures. The United States did not impose austerity, austerity measures after uh, the Great Recession and the financial crisis in 2008-2009, and you've actually seen very clearly you know, a very different set of outcomes. There was actually more money put into the system. And although um, there were more uh, in the, uh, the welfare system pushing people to work, there was also a lot more targeted payments. And during COVID, poverty went down even further, particularly child poverty and low-income family uh, poverty, because there were supplementary payments made by uh, the administration during the period of COVID. And now we see with the Biden administration, just as John said, having realised that the trickle-down economics and total deregulation um, uh, does not work. The government in the United States has passed two huge bills, but they've been a lot less than uh, they'd hoped for. One, uh, the so-called Build Back Better Infrastructure Bill, to try to you know, deal with all of the kind of problems of transportation, particularly across the government. Well, just like here in the United Kingdom, lots of bridges and roads and you know, major uh, infrastructure is falling apart. But then also the American Recovery Plan Act which is targeting now all of the things that are actually on the levelling of white paper, but at the state and local government um, uh, level in the United States. And this is going to be the largest infusion of funds into uh, the development agenda in the United States since uh, Roosevelt in the 1930s. In fact, you know, by, by contemporary measures, it's even larger than that. And so there's a recognition in the United States and even by um, some of the Republican uh, governors and mayors and things across the country, that you need those targeted uh, investment for development and the trickle-down approach isn't working. In fact, there are now metrics to show that more targeted approaches have a, a major impact on combating poverty and also on combating um, unemployment. The biggest problem in the United States remains the structural problem of not having a single-payer health system, which actually we, in you know, theory, benefit from, uh, and also having all of the benefits tied into the private sector. Uh, social security, everything, pensions is all you know, from the workplace. So, I mean, there are, there are some differences uh, there in, the, in the two systems, but I think it's actually very clear now that you need targeted uh, government interventions, even as you have the private sector and others uh, working in tandem. Can I pose a question that's related to those issues and that is a big part of the, the levelling up agenda and the white paper. Um, this is from Keith Stewart. Can levelling up be delivered without strong regional governance, whether devolved government arrangements or recreation of regional development agencies? Yeah. John, do you want to? Yeah. Um, I'm a strong supporter of uh, devolution and have been for a very long time. Um, and I would regard it as a necessary ingredient uh, in the long run to tackle the problems that I was describing earlier. Uh, the issue is that the problems that we seek to address are really deep-rooted ones. They are, they've accumulated over decades, generations now. And there are no short-term fixes to these problems. What we need are long-term generational solutions to these, gen to these problems which have built up over a long time. And what's clear from the evidence that I see around the world is that where you're able to achieve these long-term development strategies, they can bear fruit. They, they allow uh, the development of policies which really speak to the, the needs of local places, rather than are rolled out in, gen in some generic way from central government. But for that, to, for, for that to be achieved, you need strong local institutions, institutions which are rooted in, in the place uh, and places concerned. So my view is devolution is extremely important, but there's dangers attached to it as well. And the principal danger is that you devolve powers from central government to regions which are too weak to exercise them. They don't have the uh, financial resources necessary uh, in order to invest in the targeted way that uh, Fiona was talking about a moment ago in addressing the very diverse and complex 
the kinds of social problems that uh, confront us. So devolution is important, but it has to be accompanied by transfers of resources that match the scale of the problems. And we have examples around the world of where this is, is being done successfully, in my opinion. One place I point to is, is Germany, where one of the great success stories of the post-Cold War period has been the integration of the East German economy into the, um, uh, or the unification of the East and West German economies. Now that's a complicated story, um, there's lots of nuance to it, but what's not in doubt is the vast resources that were, commit, that were committed by the German government to uh, rebuilding the economy in the East. And I would argue that if we're serious about levelling up, that's the scale of response that's required in the UK. Now whether there's the political appetite for that nationally is, is questionable. Um, certainly not on the part of this government, but perhaps on the part of some future government there may be more chance. But uh, when those two things need to go together. Devolution is important because you can tailor what you do to the actual circumstances of your place. Circumstances which civil servants, let's say in London and Whitehall, can never fully grasp. But at the same time, it cannot be an excuse to leave uh, impoverished regions to struggle on their own. We belong to a national community uh, and that's the framework within which we should tackle these problems. Yeah, just to add to that, because I think what John's you know, said here is spot on. I mean, it, it's, it's getting the right frame for thinking about this, and, and that was already you know, implicit in the question. You know, what I said before about wartime economy and being in a crisis, you know, but Winston Churchill always said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And you know, obviously, uh, the, the United Kingdom, just like the United States and um, you know, other countries during wartime, actually because of necessity started to create all kinds of mechanisms to make things happen. I mean here in the United Kingdom during the war um, you had a huge amount of volunteering. You know, the Royal Voluntary Service uh, stepped up for, for example, the Women's Institute, all kinds of you know, different groups got themselves into action to do things that were necessary in that time frame. After the war we had the, the huge creation of what were essentially mechanisms for redevelopment and reconstruction. It was the, the whole creation of the National Health Service, you know, for example, and all kinds of other interventions to help you know, the United Kingdom um, rebuild. And of course, I've never once heard of the Marshall Plan, uh, which was um, uh, basically conceived of as a large recovery plan for Europe, with large transfers of money from the United States at the time. But in each case, there was a countrywide plan uh, for each of the individual countries. It led to the eventual creation of the World Bank and um, other mechanisms there to you know, help uh, development. But we've never thought about that in the context of here at home. So when I started off in uh, my career um, early on in the 1990s, I got involved in a lot of development work in the former Soviet Union. There was the creation of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, for example, that was trying to help Russia and Ukraine and other former Soviet states and Eastern European states redevelop themselves and kind of rethink you know, their economies and how they were going to redevelop their regions. That was part of that thinking that John referenced about the reunification of Germany and the mechanisms that the German government set up to try to uh, facilitate that. And we need to have that same kind of thinking now. Even if we can't have that transfer of resources like has happened in the United States or on the scale of the Marshall Plan, we can create mechanisms to try to pool resources and then to figure out what we're going to do with them. We need to have our own regional uh, development uh, plan, or our, our own uh, regional development uh, mechanisms, which, you know, as John has mentioned also, uh, would require a certain amount of, not just uh, devolution of authority, but also devolution of responsibility and capacity. And I think capacity, as John has said, is actually the key problem here. I mean, a lot of our regions don't have capacity, and part of it is because we're pitted in competition with each other. Over the last several days, while I've been back in the northeast, I've been in Sunderland and Newcastle, uh, all kinds of different discussions that I've been having with community uh, foundations and also you know, universities, is that whenever um, we're thinking about some of these rebuilding and reconstruction and development exercises in a place like Sacristan or elsewhere, or the you know, County Durham making a various bids for things like the, the City of Culture, we have to compete with other equally impoverished and struggling regions when we come to be collaborating. So the whole point of uh, the Marshall Plan, they didn't make countries compete with each other, make Greece compete with, you know, 
France or something for reconstruction. Now, they recognised that all of these countries needed uh, to be able to develop after the end of the war or uh, the destruction, and, the, uh, and they eventually that came out of that came the larger collaborations that led to the creation of the European Union. So we need to start to think about how we foster collaboration. What mechanisms can we create to get us to pool our resources? This is what the Durham miners did in Red Hills and Pitman's Parliament, and they were able to provide a whole host of basically you know, small-scale welfare, well-being uh, opportunities for their members. So if we have that same kind of concept about how can we collaborate and pool our resources uh, to develop uh, the, the um, programs that we need and what mechanisms do we need, that needs to be part of the discussion. Um, this is an interesting aspect of the, uh, the current experience with levelling up because regions have to um, compete, apply for and compete for pots of money held in Westminster and they're saying the resources required just to engage with that mechanism before you've even got the money are extraordinary and, and they don't have them because they've had so many cuts after austerity. So this is going to be a significant issue. I'd like to um, draw together a couple of questions um, that we have around education. Um, what is your main concern about the current education system in providing opportunities to young people of the UK, in particular, uh, in particular the North East? And what role do our schools, the schools in our region, have to play in levelling up? So, what's my main concern about education? Well, my main, my main concern, I suppose, is that uh, according to many of the measures, we perform very poorly um, as a region, uh, and there's no getting away from that. Um, having said that, um, you know, the, there's the issue is, to, from my from my point of view, is not always the schools. I mean, in, we have some fantastic schools and highly committed teachers in um, in the northeast. Uh, my daughter recently left her job in a law firm to become a, a teacher in a school in Peter Lee. And it's been a revelation to me to watch her take on this uh, new job. And the commitment and the seriousness with which uh, she takes that job and, and, and her colleagues take that job is something which I find sort of inspiring, frankly. Um, it's a school which faces lots of social and economic problems. The pupils come from backgrounds which uh, are very difficult um, and the school does a magnificent job in looking after those young people. Um, so, but, it, but according to some measures, you know, we have failing schools. Um, in, in my view, the issue is not, not, it's not just within the schools, it's within the wider society and it's about the extent to which many young people doubt that there are opportunities for them. Uh, or appropriate opportunities for them when they leave school. Uh, the ones who can succeed in the school system, uh, get to university, uh, have a high chance of not coming back to the region. Uh, and we lose a lot of our young people uh, to, the, uh, to, to London and, and the big cities elsewhere. Um, for those children who are not going down that route, school can be very difficult because it's not clear what the opportunities are when you, when you leave. Uh, that's what's inspiring about the, um, uh, the Woodshed Workshop project in, in Sacristan, where you have an effort, it's on a small scale, to take pupils who are really struggling in school, at home, and, and, and to be honest, you know, perhaps causing problems in their community, uh, and giving them a way forward, which is practical, and which uh, speaks to their, uh, their, their, their desires, really. It's particularly important for young men, I think, and it relates to the, some, of those, some of those statistics I was uh, offering earlier on. There's a problem about um, how we, in, particularly in a region like this, where the traditional forms of work produce traditional forms of men, how we encourage young men into forms of work which uh, are not necessarily what their fathers or grandfathers would have done. So schools are crucially important, but I think we load a lot of responsibility on the schools to solve all of these problems. Uh, many of them are doing fantastic work, but it's the wider context within which they operate, which I think is also um, I I important. Um, Levelling up must involve raising levels of educational attainment, because I was lagged behind. And there's evidence that this can be done. 
the Lon in, in London, the uh, performance of schools has improved dramatically. Uh, the reasons for this are still, I think, being debated, but a lot of it's got to do with um, innovative programs to bring, pe bring, bring teachers in from uh, outside, uh, from who, who've had careers elsewhere. Um, there's, there's, lots of, there's lots to learn from these, uh, these, pro uh, th these processes in, in places like London. Education is crucial. There's no more important job than being a school teacher and inspiring young people to learn. Uh, one thing that I've done recently is I've uh, taken on a role as a volunteer classroom reading assistant. Um, it's one of the more, it's possibly the most rewarding thing I do in a week, actually, um, teaching seven-year-olds to, to read. Um, and so there's, and again, you see the struggles that schools have, the, the complex things that they're dealing with, and the incredible commitment of teachers, which is really undervalued in our society. And in other societies, we really, you know, other societies place much greater value on the contribution that teachers make. And if you look to the, the, the societies that do really well in educational rankings, the PISA rankings produced by the OECD, uh, countries like Finland and Singapore, teaching is such a high status job in those countries. Uh, and we should be rebuilding, and one of the things we need to do is value our teachers, rebuild the status of the teaching profession, support them, and um, that is a key component of, of, of what's required, I think. Good. Before I ask you this question about education, can I just add a twist? So this is from yeah. Bridget Gray, uh, Graham Bradley, who I think is a teacher at St. Leonard's. Uh, as a teacher in the Northeast for 33 years, I feel I am seeing an increasing poverty of ambition born out of a previous poverty of opportunity. Can this be healed? Yeah, look, I mean, that, that's the, the big question, isn't it? I mean, the title of um, the book uh, that I wrote, There's Nothing For You Here, is what my dad said to me in 1984 when I wanted to, you know, have an education and thought I'd like to go to university. And he said, well, if you do that, you know, Pat, there's going to be nothing for you here. You know, there won't be a job uh, that, you know, would fit with those qualifications. And I also, you know, wanted to work on Russia and national security, and I wasn't going to do that with Bishop Auckland. So there was that kind of you know, push to, to leave. Now, that doesn't mean to say that those kinds of opportunities, even in national security or thinking about politics, you know, couldn't exist here in, uh, in the northeast of England. At earlier times, people were really engaged in, in, in big uh, global questions. So, you know, those kinds of opportunities could, you know, come, uh, come back again. But I do think that that, um, as I said, the kind of the issue about people then educated to leave the region is, is part of the major problem. And the, I'm sure, look, I know there's a lot of people here who've come into the region to teach in, in schools, to teach at Durham, to you know, be part of the, um, you know, other you know, jobs and professions. I know there's quite a few people here who've come in and have been here. You know, if I've got a friend who's sitting uh, there, Sarah, who went to university with St Andrews, and she's here teaching at Durham University. And as she pointed out to me, the days now lived in Durham longer than I lived in Durham because I left when I was 18, and she's, she's right. And I've actually always myself wanted to find a way of coming back. I've now got that opportunity, and I'm going to try to make the most of it to kind of come back and help on this because it's kind of a way of, of trying to reframe everything. Everything is about networks and connections, and we can all create networks. So, you know, as, you, as um, we've been mentioned, some of the best models, you know, for having this more inclusive education have come from other countries like Finland and, and elsewhere. We can make networks to people, not just from Finland, but from elsewhere around the country for best practices. It's something, you know, we do in so many um, other fields. Why not in education as well? When I was 13, I went on one of the school exchanges from County Durham to Tübingen uh, in Germany. And I'm actually going there again next week. But it would have been good for me to maybe go on an exchange to another kind of school, you know, somewhere else in the United Kingdom. There are, in London, there are all these uh, academies, like the Harris Academy Network, for example. We don't really have those here in the Northeast, but why don't we, you know, connect with them and, and figure out how to plug in? Why do we have teacher exchanges? And as John said, volunteering in schools. Every single one of you in here could actually go and volunteer in a school, including the sixth formers. You could go back to a primary school, or you could go down lower down in the forms at your school and go and talk to other students and give them an idea of what you've done and why you've done it and you know why you're interested in the things that you're interested in. There's that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring that you could do. You don't have to be old to be a mentor. You don't have to wait until you're 56. You could do it at 16. You could be a mentor to a kid who's seven, you know, for example, or eight. You could go and help them you know, with their reading. 
if you're in business, you know, you can go back into schools, go back to your school, you know, your primary school and your secondary school, and go back in and tell them about what you did, how you did it, you know, how you got ahead, and help teachers understand what opportunities there are out there. And I was talking in another setting about, you know, when we had like work placement. Um, I actually had a very interesting work placement for a week with the Teesdale Mercury. Um, uh, as, a, as a sort of shadow journalist uh, covering agricultural shows. And I got my first byline, Bob grows a bopper, that <laughs> a very large leak. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I, I'll never forget that, but it wasn't something I put on my resume because it's explained. Uh, but, you know, one of my, the, the other placements were terrible. I was, I was set up to sell patio doors, you know, to people who couldn't have kind of afford their mortgage payments or their rents, kind of calling them up over tea time when they were trying to have, you know, their, their tea and trying to flog patio doors to them. And anyway, then all those call centres went to Mumbai anyway, so you know, that wasn't a kind of a growth industry in the north. But now we've got, you know, so much of other industry. We've got the North East Chamber of Commerce, we've got the Small Business Association, we've got businesses that invest, you know, here and everywhere, you know, around the region. How do we tie them in? How do we get the businesses to come into schools as well? Not just the sixth form, but, you know, all the way down in uh, the... Um, and the system, and that's something that does actually happen in the United States. There's a lot more of linking together of different schools. Some of the big private schools in the United States, for example, get donations to bring other kids from all the way around uh, the country for special programs. Now, because we're all in a Zoom world, we could do some of this by Zoom. I've been talking to kids in schools across the whole of the United States and just telling them, you know, about my story. Uh, which translates into you know, many of the impoverished regions of the United States as well. So anybody here, any of you, could do something like that as well. And I think that will help with those issues of opportunities, being an assistance to teachers, being a resource, being a mentor, and giving somebody an opportunity. And again, it's networks, and it's the power of all of us here. Thank you, Fiona. So um, we're getting quite a few questions about um, the strength of communities and local culture which is something that's so potent in the North East. I remember a comment you made at another event, Fiona, talking about the transition from a uh, local miners' association up to the National Union of Miners in the 1980s, and the fact that the NUN really lost that sense of locality and rootedness in the local culture, and, and that caused enormous division. Um, and we've spoken quite a lot about levelling up, really coming from local communities, helping themselves. How can communities draw strength when communities are so muddled and seem to be struggling with division, differences, and divided loyalties? Wow, <laughs> there's a question. Um, yeah, I think many of the communities, many of the traditional mining villages of Durham are increasingly fractured, and you know, Sacristan's a place where I've heard stories to that effect. Um, how do you overcome those divisions? Um, well, a two-part two answer to that. The first is that we can romanticize the past of mining villages. Mining villages often contain their divisions. We think of them now as these sort of very cohesive places where everybody pulled together and so on. And there's a great deal of truth in that story. But there's another story, which is that uh, they, had, they contained their own divisions. I mean, a very obvious one was around gender. Uh, but a, a, another one was around religion. So if you, if you look back um, at the early history of Sacristan, sorry to keep going on about Sacristan, but um, as you can tell, I've developed a, uh, a small obsession with it. Um, if you go back to the very early history of Sacristan, um, it was a place characterized in the 19th century by incredible ethnic divisions, primarily between Catholics and Protestants. Um, when the Catholics, uh, when the Irish arrived in the 1860s en masse to Sacristan and occupied what were the cross streets just off the front street in Sacristan, they were an Irish speaking community. They came en masse from Galway. There's a, fat, there's a fantastic little, well, it's not, it's not actually a brilliant history, it's quite a flawed history, but a history nevertheless of the early Catholic parish in Sacristan in which Father Lenders um, talks about how uh, this was like the Wild West in Sacristan. There were fights every weekend between the Irish and the non-Irish. Usually, he says, because uh, they had insulted their religion. Um, you know, 
their, their region would be insulted and, and fights would, would, would break out. I've been looking back through the, the newspaper um, uh, archives on all this and I find um, Patrick Tomney being bound over to keep the peace for brawling uh, with Irishmen and others uh, in Sacristan uh, in the 1870s. So these were not the cohesive communities. That cohesion was built over time. Catholics built their church, the Methodists built their chapels, but by 1920 they all came together to, to create a single um, concert in the aftermath of the First World War, the combined choirs of the Primitive Methodists, the Wesleyan Methodists and the Catholics to give thanks for the end of the war. And that would have been absolutely unbelievable uh, a, a generation before. And, one, and the Catholics also led the raising of funds in the, in, during the First World War to support Belgian refugees who'd fled the war zone and come to the northeast of England. And money was raised locally in Sacristan, the Catholics led it, but brought in the Methodists as well, um, to house Belgian refugees in, in Sacristan. Um, this again is hard to imagine from this distance in time. So divisions were there and they were overcome. The way they were overcome was through the existence of institutions which allowed that to happen. The churches, the miners' lodge, the co-op, the literary institute in Sacristan. These were places where people mixed and of course a workplace where whether you were Catholic or Protestant and the roof came in in the pit, it didn't matter. Everybody had to pull together. So there's a lessons from our history in, in relation to all of that. And I think today, again, you know, Examples like these, uh, the Woodshed Workshop in Sacristan provide ways forward about how we overcome some of these problems. So the workshop, the Woodshed Workshop is drawing in young, young men, young boys who have been uh, uh, causing problems perhaps in their communities, uh, have been vilified in their communities for this. Um, we're trying to show them there's another way uh, to, to, to live yeah, and to behave. Uh, and this can lead you on to uh, opportunities. And it's, there's some really incredible stories coming out of this, um, this experience. So we have lessons from our history and we have examples today of, of, of how it can be done. None of these things are easy, all of them require resources. Pennies and sixpences are no longer enough um, to, to, to build what we need. Uh, we need resources from outside because the they don't exist within the village in the same way that they would have done in the past. But there are ways forward on, on all of this. Um, and we need to uh, learn from our own, ex our own history, our contemporary experiences, spread that learning among the communities of County Durham. Uh, and there's, there's, there's lots to be positive about in all of this. We've got, we've got so many questions. Um, so I'm going to move on. And this one is definitely uh, for you initially, Fiona. And there is going to be a levelling up dimension to this. Is Russia the biggest threat to the UK? That's from Imad, St. Cuthbert High School. Well, um, at this particular uh, juncture, yes, uh, unfortunately. Um, you know, we have a lot of focus on China as a larger systemic threat. But China hasn't invaded Ukraine um, or Taiwan, you know, thank goodness, at this uh, particular juncture. China isn't threatening, you know, uh, any of us with the explosion of a nuclear weapon, you know, bringing us all the way back uh, to the 1980s where I set off and uh, studying Russian. And, you know, unfortunately, it's uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin who have brought us to this, you know, particular period of crisis. And again, the third major power confrontation and war on European soil in just a bit over um, a century. And how we deal with that is, um, is pretty critical. Uh, John, actually, to kind of bring it back to the, you know, the larger agenda, mentioned uh, raising funds for Belgian refugees from World War One. Remember, um, you know, Germany invaded the Low Countries in Belgium in 1914. Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014, you know, exactly 100 years on, and began, I mean, we all think it just happened on February 24th of this year, but this has all been going on since 2014, exactly 100 years afterwards. I think people here have been remarkable on assisting Ukraine. And I'm sure the people sitting here in the audience who've been hosting refugees from Ukraine have also been raising money uh, for Ukrainian refugees as well. And that's also shaped this kind of sense of solidarity. We've seen, think about the Ukrainians pulling together 
in the face of just such extreme adversity to fight back against you know, this horror of an invasion that's been uh, pushed on them by one person. That in itself, you know, also shows a kind of a, a spirit and an ability to do things in extremis. And I do want to, you know, kind of you know, tie that back to our larger, you know, kind of agenda here. When we are under siege, when we see such problems, that, like we've, we've often come up with solutions. And, and again, we've got to kind of figure out in this context, if I said a one-time economy, a really dangerous situation in Europe and in the United Kingdom for us on the economic front, because we're at financial war, you know, even if not in a kind of direct conflict uh, with Russia at this particular point, about then how we're still going to help ourselves on the home front in this kind of context. And there was one um, thing that I wanted to add to what John had just um, said here, because again, we've got six, six farmers and others here. Sport is a phenomenal Unify. It can be a divider when you're all kind of fighting against a team with you like Newcastle, Sunderland or Middlesbrough. But it's also kind of something that really brings people together. And one of the real elements of the, um, the miners and the thing that happened in County Durham in the North East was creating, these, uh, was, was creating football teams. My granddad, which is from Sacriston, but didn't do it in Sacriston because it's, it's not all about Sacriston, of course, um, <laughs> set up um, uh, something called a, a welfare club in Rodinger, just outside of Crook in uh, County Durham, that's still going. And they did it by just, you know, putting their resources together. My granny actually made the uniforms. I think this would be a bit weird looking, because uh, I think she handmade them <laughs> without, uh, God knows what they look like when they got on their kit on the, on the field. They just had to wash them all as well. But they sort of started off, you know, with, with nothing, and that, that team's still going. It was set up in the 1920s, so the 1930s, and it's still, it's, uh, it's still going. And sport was a, a real unifier. And although there was always a kind of a gender division, inside the mining communities and women's uh, football was banned in the 1920s because they thought it would get too popular and might be um, you know kind of a, a challenge for the men we now see that um, women's football has really taken off and of course it was however the losses who won uh, the european uh, the men have not done that yet just just saying uh, soccer. and i think we can really see just the enthusiasm that uh, that, that football and uh, other sports can uh, really engender here as well. So there's a lot of actually examples in the United States about sports being used as a community builder. So for Portland, there's a place in Portland, Maine called Portland Community Squash. I don't think squash is quite as big here in the UK, but I actually I, um, advise people to go and have a look at the website because they're doing an amazing thing using squash to bring entire, an entire community together and bringing the kids and their families and giving them mentoring for school and giving them meals and transportation and making sure they're not on the streets after school and helping them to think about education, not just university education, but vocational education, all through the prism of squash. And they're trying to take this national through in sports as well. We could do that here. I mean, we've, we've done it for years, you know, generations with football. We could do it, you know, through in all kinds of different uh, capacities. I know I, I did a kind of a bit of a... A bit one of those, you know, bends it like Beckham away from uh, Russia onto football. Very well done, Fiona. Thank you. Okay, we, we're getting a lot of questions about um, which of our two main political parties, Conservatives or Labour, are better for levelling up. So I'm going to try and gather all those together. Um, what, so for example, what prevented um, the um, Blair and Brown governments from levelling up between 97 and 2010? Uh, and there just seem to be two different <laughs> models here. Uh, Labour investment in schools, R&D, uh, Conservatives cutting tax, um, uh, which of those is better for levelling up? Is Labour necessarily any better given its commitment, ongoing commitment to neoliberal economics? Uh, there we go, John. Well, according to Tony, the taxi driver who brought me here, they're both the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's one answer. Uh, and I did say I'd give Tony a mention because he had a lot of thoughts about these these issues, some of them not for repeating uh, in, in this session. Um, well, you know, in a sense, New Labour did have a strong commitment to regional policy. It, uh, it, it, it created regional development agencies, it, it funded them far more generously than the Conservatives have done since 2010. Um, but I think it was a central difficulty that New Labour had. One was that uh, the economy of London and the South at that time was growing at a very fast rate. It was the after effect of the Big Bang which had provided a massive stimulus to the financial services industry concentrated in London that 
Canary Wharf example that I talked about earlier on, the City of London. And so, uh, although New Labour was investing much more in the regions uh, than the Conservatives and the Coalition did afterwards, um, arguably it simply wasn't enough to counteract these very powerful uh, forces which were concentrating economic growth in London and the South. Now the counterfactual is, would regional inequalities have widened further without this expansion? Well, we don't really ever know, we'll ever know the answer to that. Um, but what is clear is that austerity, which occurred after 2010, that is to say, cuts of public expenditure, massively and disproportionately impacted uh, on, the, um, on the North, on, on, across the whole North. Um, the places which uh, suffered the most in terms of cuts were the places which had the highest social need. That's a demonstrable fact. Um, and in fact, in some places in the south, in the most prosperous parts of the south, local government spending went up. That's a, so that's, that, that's the difference between the two during this period. Now, of course, the Conservatives um, talked about the northern powerhouse, was it? Uh, yeah, that's the one, yeah. Um, I remember that? It was the thing before levelling up. Um, so so there, was the, there was the northern powerhouse, there was a, a modest forms of devolution to city regions and so on. Um, but these, again, were modest, measured against the size of the problems and the forces which are propelling economic growth and wealth to concentrate in London and the South. So, neither, neither party has really um, uh, provided, at the moment, a solution to this problem. Now, it's very likely, according to, well, according to opinion polls, if there's an election tomorrow, we'll see that the extinction of the Tory party, more or less. But let's assume there's an election in a year or two's time and Labour comes into power. What's its plans for levelling up? I think that's very, very unclear. It's not at all clear to me what, uh, what, what they would do. And, and they're struggling to find the right answer to this question. Now, there are aspects of the existing levelling up agenda, which I said earlier, which would, I think, you know, could be developed by an incoming Labour government, particularly things around, um, let's say, decentralising research and development from London and the South. Uh, there are things that, government, that, that, that you could take from the White Paper there. But as I've said as well, there are massive gaps in the White Paper, particularly when it comes to thinking about what you do in uh, places where communities are under stress and perhaps, in some respects, fracturing. I don't think there's any answers to those questions. Um, I said earlier that there's a responsibility on the part of universities to contribute to this. I, I believe this very, very strongly. But universities don't have the answer. We have knowledge, we have expertise, we have resources, but the answers to these questions lie in the communities which for so long have felt ignored and left behind. And unless we resolve that conundrum, there will be no levelling up, and Tony will be right. You know, he said it'll never happen, is what he said to me. Um, we'll always be second rank. Um, I hope he's wrong, um, but I understand why he thinks the way he does. Yeah, I do want to um, add something to this because I think there's two issues here that we all just have to recognise, which is one of the reasons why I think neither side has, um, has really succeeded here. The first is just what John was talking about. So everything is a top-down approach because we're a very, very centralised country in the United Kingdom and not from the bottom up. I mean, the, the reason that the United States and Germany function differently is because they have very strong federal systems. So a lot of decisions can be made on the, the level of the states in the United States, and then mayors in cities have a lot of power, but also all the way down to the kind of community level. You've got a, a whole series of different structures and mechanisms at different levels, and they feed up, not just down. And that's the problem here in the United Kingdom, fundamentally. Then second, there's a complete lack of understanding about the history and structure of the north of England, and not just the northeast, but you know a little bit more broadly. The northeast was like East Germany or like the Soviet Union. We were nationalized and very dependent on heavy industry. In all the generations of my family, nobody ever worked for themselves. I don't know anybody in my family apart from one family that we married into who had a shop who actually worked in the private sector. Everybody worked for either one of the big industrialists, and every member of my family worked for one of the big industrialists all the way over in the northeast, or on as tenant farmers on some big landowner's land, or eventually in British something. 
you know, right down to my dad when he lost his job in uh, the coal industry in the National Health Service. So that, that whole sense of entrepreneurialism isn't really there either. And that, that's a skill. I mean, you have to kind of teach in schools, that gets back to our education. But it's also then, it's the structure of our economic system. When you had mass privatisation in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher living in Grantham, and being the daughter of a small business owner, had no conception of what it actually was like to work in a nationalised industry. And as um, John uh, was saying also, you know, signing all of the, the new industry in the financial sector, going you know, somewhere else, uh, particularly in London, people didn't have the skills uh, to follow that. They didn't have the opportunities, they didn't have the knowledge about how to move. But then there was also then no way of attracting back in different kinds of industries and sectors. It was all just like, building off the old manual labor, uh, existing uh, education and capital there. And the same thing happened in the Soviet Union, which I know sounds mental to people thinking about collect, you know, comparing the northeast of England with the Soviet Union. But when I was a student in 1987, coming straight from living here in County Durban, I went to the Soviet Union, I thought that's just like the Northeast on a bigger scale. Everybody works for the state, which is what everybody did here as well. And, and then with the mass privatization in the 1990s, <coughs> then the Soviet Union you know, kind of fell apart. The shock therapy was exactly what had happened here in the United Kingdom, especially in the Northeast in the 1980s. Everybody out of a job all, all of a sudden no new economy, no skills, and that's what led to Putin. Because his base is the same base of support that you know, uh, brought Trump to the fore in the Midwest. It was the same when I got to the United States, the old industrial belt. It wasn't nationalized, but it was these huge, massive enterprises, factories, where everybody's entire lives were circumscribed by, and then when you know, the Bethlehem steel plant goes, or the, the big car factory, again, it's the same, it's the same problem. So recognizing that, that you've got a huge structural problem in certain regions is pretty critical. So then you have to think, as John has you know, said, that you've got a multi-generational approach to this. And you've got to have all aspects pulled together, which is again why we need these mechanisms to create collaboration rather than pitting people in competition. Because if we do keep on competing for funding, we don't have mechanisms to pull things together, we're not going to solve this, but it's going to take generations and every aspect of everything we've been talking about tonight is going to have to come into play. Thank you, Fiona. I'm so sorry that we've run out of time um, now. This has been a fantastic discussion, a wonderful, a wonderful debate. I'd like to draw things together. One question that's been towards the top of the list all evening that uh, John um, has addressed. Uh, what is, in your opinion, is the role of religions and their influence on politics. And John spoke about uh, the divisions in some of the communities around uh, Irish immigration, Catholics and Methodists and so on. It's worth remembering that there is a long tradition of the involvement of religion in politics in this region. St. Cuthbert built his hermitage on the Farne Islands within sight of the King of Northumbria's castle. This was religion confronting the power of the day. William van Milder, the Bishop of Durham, endowed the University in Durham for the Northeast when he knew that the funds were about to be stolen by London. There's a long tradition of involvement in the mining uh, communities and culture in this great building where we try to give voice to human hope. Uh, a comment was made earlier this evening that hope is not the same as optimism. We could be realistic and quite pessimistic and still maintain hope because hope is about a kind of eternal aspiration that this great building is supposed to embody. And that's what the people of the Northeast are so wonderful at, is hope, even when we have to be brutally realistic and sometimes pessimistic about where we are. But we are driven on. And this debate this evening, I think, has been part of that, driving on in hope as we get a discussion going about what on earth levelling up might mean for us. So can I invite you to um, give a very big round of applause to our two speakers.
reminder to our schools that we'd be very happy to have a follow-up visit on these issues if you would like that. You have my contact details. Uh, the programme for the Cathedral Institute will continue uh, certainly next year. We have already booked Catherine Stone, the outgoing Independent Commissioner for Standards in the House of Commons, who will be coming to speak to us about ethics in public life. And there will be plenty more in the programme very soon. We do hope you'll be able to join us for that. Thank you very much indeed. Good night.